Starless, Aqualong, In the Land of Grain Pink, Relayer, Tarkus, Misplaced Childhood. What do all of these albums have in common? Well, for one, they're all classic progressive rock albums. But aside from that, they have all been reissued over the last decade, and each of those releases have been remastered by the same man, Stephen Wilson. When I fell in love with music, I fell in love with um, not just the songs and the artists, but the texture and the sound of records. And my Today we're going to take a look at Stephen Wilson's remixes. At the time of making this video, he's done 53 classic albums, the majority of which are prog rock staples. Think about what you might be faced with if you're trying to remaster an album like a passion play. The original mix is part of the craft of the album, part of what made it great to begin with. So what gets changed, and what kind of process is involved with such a monumental undertaking? Well, let's start with Stephen Wilson. The first thing you should know is that he's a prolific progressive rock musician himself. He's probably best known as the vocalist and songwriter for his band Porcupine Tree and his later solo projects. He started releasing his own music in the 90s, working with several psychedelic rock projects, and he's been steadily releasing albums with a whole slew of different bands and groups, often several in a year. Wilson is a renowned sound engineer and producer, and has worked with a ton of other bands' recordings in addition to his own. Among these are releases by Opeth, Yoko Ono, and Marillion. I think it's fair to say that he's qualified for the job. Stephen Wilson has a unique philosophy on mixing and mastering, one that makes him a prime candidate for bands and record companies looking to remaster a classic album, and he's increasingly the go-to engineer for many groups who are coming up on an anniversary release. One thing that you hear immediately from Stephen Wilson's mixes are that they are relatively quiet. This comes from a justified stance that reducing the overall volume of the music allows for a greater dynamic range. Starting in the 90s with the widespread adoption of CDs, music producers began to focus on loudness as a mixing element. This became what is known as the loudness war. Producers would apply heavy compression across the entire album, limiting the dynamic range of the music in favor of increasing volume. This kind of compression brings the lighter portions of the music up and crunches the frequencies of the instruments in a way that often produces a distorted clipping. You can hear this kind of clipping as far back as Californication by the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but it was more and more apparent into the mid-2000s. Metallica's 2008 album, Death Magnetic, is a well-known example of this. The top waveform shows the version of the song that was released on the CD, and the bottom one is an uncompressed version that was released on Guitar Hero. So you can see how much of the dynamic range was taken away. It's a casualty of the loudness war. Very early on, Stephen Wilson came out as being very against this practice. And though some of his work in Porcupine Tree wasn't necessarily the quietest music, he would adopt the approach of a generally quieter mix in favor of dynamics. Another main aspect of his approach has to do with the resolution standard that he mixes at. By this point, all of the albums that Wilson has remixed had already been re-released for CD. The conversion into a digital audio medium is something that should be done very carefully. Yet, some of the music that was released before Stephen Wilson's were just the master tape of an album directly converted into a different format. And we'll get to what Stephen does instead in a minute. The CD format uses a standard of 16 bits per sample, meaning 16 bits of information in each point of time which makes up an audio signal. Each of these points in time are sampled across a particular frequency, which for CD is 44.1 kHz. This means that the audio is recorded by sampling it 44,100 times per second, and then each of these samples are used to reconstruct the audio signal when playing it back. While this is generally the standard in the music industry, Stephen Wilson opts in for a resolution of a 96 kilohertz and 24-bit standard. Some people say that this resolution difference isn't really all that noticeable to the ear, 
but as Stephen Wilson says, even if it were 0.1% better, why not? And this resolution allows for other benefits as well. These higher resolution recordings are released on Blu-ray discs and 5.1 surround sound, and if you've got the equipment for it, it's an audiophile's dream come true. To avoid degrading the mix in any way, Wilson gets the original tapes from the labels or bands themselves and painstakingly recreates the major aspects of the mix with the added clarity of digital mixing. He puts it pretty well himself. He says, my goal is always the same. Be as faithful as you possibly can to the original mix and don't try to modernize it or improve it in any way, but allow for the fact that you're going back to an earlier generation of tape. Remember that every kind of mix, every vinyl master, and every copy of a master is a further reduction in sound quality, but by using the original tape, I inherently knew I was going to get a more tone out of the music and more out of the recording itself than anyone had been able to before. Wilson's first major remixing gig came with the 40th anniversary series of King Crimson's releases starting in 2009. Their first album, In the Court of the Crimson King, was originally released in 1969 and had been remixed and mastered several times since then. For this release, they wanted a major update and saw Stephen Wilson's 5.1 mixes as an interesting step forward. Working with Robert Fripp himself, they worked their way through the entire King Crimson catalog. By 2011, Wilson's proclivity for remixing prog had gotten around, and he was commissioned for the 40th anniversary release of Jethro Tull's Aqualung. From then on, he became something of a go-to guy for these types of releases, being hired for releases from Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Hawkwind, Yes, Gentle Giant, Rush, Tangerine Dream, and Marillion. Aside from the prog greats, he remixed albums for XTC, Chicago, and Roxy Music. In total, he's done 53 remixes so far, and as more albums reach landmark anniversaries, more are sure to follow. In each of these albums, Wilson has an incredible opportunity to interact with the music in a way that very few people ever get to. Each track is sent to him as 9624 digital versions, which are sometimes very hard to track down. For example, the tapes from Aqualung were dug out of storage and digitally transferred at Abbey Road Studios before being handed to Steven on a hard drive. Then he starts the process by sifting through each individual track and putting them into place in the session. This is something that he often does sitting in a hotel room after one of his gigs on a tour, taking days and days to get a basic mix that recreates the magic of the original while still trying to improve on whatever he can. Along with the final takes of each instrument, he'll often get a tape that has outtakes, studio noise, and sometimes even conversations caught between the takes that no one has heard in 40 years. In this process, he gets a glimpse into the personalities of the musicians, even their moods at the time during the sessions. After he's gotten the basic mix, he takes the sessions into the studio where he's able to mix the whole thing in surround recreating the performance aspects of the mix and emulating the reverbs, delays, and echo effects in 5.1. It makes it feel like Steve Howery and Anderson are playing just across the room. Modern digital mixing allows for an incredible amount of freedom. Most analog effect units have been modeled and emulated faithfully to the real thing, and in a lot of ways you're able to have more control over things like volume automation and effect parameters. In places where the instruments would have had to have been manually faded in, up, out, or down, digital mixing allows for buttery smooth transitions. When working on the mix for Yes is Close to the Edge, these mixing elements were particularly challenging. He says every little guitar phrase, every little vocal nuance, every little bass lick, and every little drum fill has been potentially pushed up in the mix manually. What that means is that you can't just set your levels and let the mix run through. You have to literally analyze every few seconds, every few bars of music. I had to constantly compare back to the original mix. So as he's listening, he might come across a drum fill that needs to lift it out slightly, and he'd have to do that, or just a little guitar lick that might have went unnoticed if you weren't listening carefully, needs bumped up in the mix a little bit, or things like the vocal part fading into the reverb. When he gets a mix to a certain point, He'll sometimes get the musicians themselves to give direct input, and if Wilson can get their seal of approval, it gets handed off back to the record label who commissioned the remix. Now, for the most important question, how's it sound? <laughs> 
Though Wilson tries to avoid making any album sound more modern, it's inevitable that the remix will have a slightly more modern sound to it by default. There is a distinctive clarity that you just can't get from working with analog mixes. It takes a place of the top end roll off that you get with tape. Of course the tape sound has its merits, and I personally enjoy the analog sound as much as anyone else, but those recordings still exist with or without the new mix. So let's have a look at some of the music. The first thing that you probably hear is the quieter mix. The new mix has more clarity than harmonies, but it comes at the cost of a little of the top end distortion from the analog mixes. It's a sound that kind of glues the harmonies together. But there is a greater degree of separation of the harmonies, and you can hear each voice with a greater clarity than before. When the shaker comes in, the new mix removes a lot of the slosh from it. It sounds more directly on the beat and more of a punctuated stab of rhythm. The next example we're going to take a look at is Songs from the Wood by Jethro Tull. You can immediately hear how the piano part is brought out in the Wilson mix. It feels like most of the upper middle frequencies of the original mix were all smashed together. The piano kind of blends in with the vocal harmonies and the guitar stabs. And I'd have to say that the Stephen Wilson mix does a great job of making all the different instrumental voices stand apart in relation to one another. When it gets to the galliards and lute songs served in Chilling Ale line, where the instruments break away from one another with a little bit of hocketing, you really get a taste for how much the dynamic range has been extended. The bass sounds deeper, and the higher frequencies sound crisper and more defined. I think that it's a perfect example of what a modern mix can do to a classic album, and it still retains the spirit of the original. Stephen Wilson's remixes are full of very interesting mixing choices, and maybe at some point we could go over them more in depth. But I think that that's all for this video. We've got the history of Stephen Wilson's mixes and a little bit of a look into his process. If you like this video, then I encourage you to go check out some of my other videos. My channel mostly focuses on looking at classic progressive rock bands and the innovations that they made to the genre. And if you're into this kind of thing, subscribe to the channel, give this video a like, and comment down below what band you'd like me to cover next, or if you have any other ideas, I'm open to different subjects, kind of like this one, as long as it's prog. Alright, thank you, and I'll see you next time.